Praise the Lord. All right, if you can, <clears throat> please turn to Joshua chapter 24. <clears throat> I had the opportunity to give a talk at camp and to be a, and to chair, which is MC, which is actually great. It's, <laughs> I didn't find out about it that Saturday beforehand. Everything was TBA. You know, I found out that Saturday beforehand. I was when scheduled to do something, but you know, the Lord, he took care of it all. So, and in the talk that I gave on the second morning, this is a scripture that I did as my lead in, but today we're looking at it from a different aspect. If you are there in Joshua chapter 24, and we'll pick it up right with verse number 14. And this is Joshua speaking to the children of Israel, and he was speaking to them, um, right before they're ready to go out to claim their inheritance, okay? And can you guys hear me okay? I'm just gonna give it to you. All right, my voice is kind of croaky, so I'm sorry about that. No, it's fine. How's that? Good, all right. Okay, Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem even unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. For the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood were the gods of Amorite, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve of the gods. For the Lord our God, he is it, he is he that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who did these great things in our sight and preserved us in the way wherein we went, among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwelt in the land. Therefore, we'll also serve the Lord, for he is our God. Not bad sounding words. And the thing that I wanted to stress is, like what I mentioned in our talk, that when Joshua mentioned these words, Joshua wasn't stating what he was going to do. He was stating basically what he had done already because Joshua, he had been serving the Lord since right at the beginning, since the Exodus. Joshua was one of those who was serving the Lord. He was there through everything that they went through. He was there through the part of the Red Sea. Uh, he was there when a children of Israel decided to rebel and had to be in the wilderness for 40 years. He was there through it all as one who was a leader, one who knew that he had to serve. And, the interesting thing about Joshua, that again, he was in that generation that had to suffer through the 40 years in the wilderness. Yet he was, of the two, decided to make a stand for the Lord, to just serve the Lord. But yet, he had to go through what he had to go through. He was bitter about it, but he knew that he was called to serve. I guess that's really what I want to look at, the whole concept of serving. Because even though the children of Israel said that we will serve the Lord, we know from history that they just couldn't do it. It just they were great in saying all the right words, but as soon as situation circumstances happened, they changed their mind. And so what Joshua had to do, he, he restated to the children of Israel its commitment to serve. It was expected of them. There was no option. They, they had no option. Uh, they were God's selected people called to serve. He, he basically called them to serve. He didn't call them to be slaves. He called them to serve. And there's a difference between a servant and a slave. A slave is basically property. A slave is basically something that you used, and if it didn't work anymore, you tossed it and threw it aside. But a servant was somebody who was looked after by the master. The servant was somebody who, was, who had benefits of his, his service. And so God called Israel to be ser serve him, not to be slaves. And just get an idea like how they were called. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, please. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 10. And it says, And it shall be that the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. 
and the houses full of all good things which thou fillest, fillest not, and wells diggest which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt leave, when thou shalt have, when thou shalt have eaten it before. Then be aware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. You shall, you shall not go after other gods or the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from the face of the earth. So right there we're saying, okay, first of all, he says, look, I am the one who chose you. You know, and, and all these blessings I'm going to give you, he says, you know, you didn't, you didn't choose me. You didn't say, oh, okay, well, let's see. Uh, hmm. Well, let's just, just this God, let's, let's, let's go with God. Let's, let's see what we can do to serve him. God says, no, you, I handpicked. I mean, you think about it. Here he was of all the nations in the world. He built up this nation of Israel as his children. So he, they were selected by God. They were selected by, elected by God to serve. Okay, let's go over to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Just a couple of verses. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse number 6. For thou art in the holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen to be, be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the faith of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you are more in number than little people. For you are the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because you would keep the oath which is sworn to your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So again, he said, okay, I have chosen you. I didn't pick you because you're the greatest. I didn't pick you because of might. I picked you for a particular pur purpose. I picked you to serve me. And when you think about that, it, it's, it's, <laughs> but, a lot of the people would be probably uh, not happy with that sort of arrangement. Hmm. What do you mean you pick me? You can't make me do this. You can't make me do that. And I'm sure that was some of the attitudes that Israel had. But, you know, when you think about it, you know, like I said, they did not choose God. He gathered them together. I guess they're were, they were probably God's selective service. Okay? They were called to be selective service. They were selected people to be in service to God. And I guess in that regard, you can say they were conscripted or drafted. When somebody's conscripted a draft, it's like somebody grabs and says, okay, this is what you've been tagged to serve. I mean, most people, we know that in regards to military. If somebody wants to bring together an army, they go out and conscript guys. I mean, in the old days, like <laughs> back in the pirates, they conscripted, hitting somebody over the head and dragging them aboard a ship. Those years got a little bit more civilized and they said, okay, you, Chris, you're going to serve an army. You, Michael, you're going to serve an army. And that was, and they had no choice. They grabbed you. The conscriptions, what they called um, selective service. I mean, even the states. At one point, we had selective service. We had a draft system. And I did a little bit of research, and they had a draft system going all the way back to the Civil War. That because the the Union needed people in the army, they had a, a form of selective service. But it was fraught with fraud because if you were rich, you could buy your way out of it. <laughs> what they would do. If you're rich, you tell, buy somebody to stand in for your place. You say, hey, here, here. I mean, this guy's going to take my place. So it's fraught with all sort of disaster. And so that that ended. But then when World War World War One happened, they found that they only had a peacetime army of 100,000 men in the peacetime army. That was it. You, there's no way you go to a battle in a war with that. So they again, they started selective service. Then after World War One, that died off. Then World War Two happened. And they needed more guys. It was interesting because, you know, you talk about the nation of Israel being 600,000 people. I think they were saying out of the 28 million individuals that had a potential to be called, I think this is 6 million actually called up in the first year of World War II. Okay, World War II died out, but then they still needed an army, so then they kept the draft going. And anybody, who was at my age, were anybody from 18 years, they were drafted people from 18 years to 45 years old. And <laughs> the draft, if you're 18 years old, when you turn 18, one of the most hated moments in your life, because you knew you're going to be up for the draft. And at that time, you had no clue if you're going to be drafted or not. It was just at the luck of the draw. And so a lot of guys would think about what they're going to do. People just decided they're going to take off from Canada, overseas, just to be 
keep it being drafted. I know uh, personally, I was able to get past that because uh, when I graduated from high school, I was going to go to school for like trying to so like what they call a deferment. But before I had a deferment, I had to go through something called their pre-induction physical, which means you had a whole day that you spent going through this whole battery of physical. I mean, they did you test here, test there, and then actually did an aptitude test just to show that if you had a classification. And they, based on your results, they classified you as 1A or 1F. F, you know, good, A, good. And so even though I didn't get eventually drafted, I had to go through that whole rigmarole myself. It was incredible and sometimes downright embarrassing, okay, what you had to go through. I mean, you walk around all day long in just your undies. And it's not exactly the most comfortable thing you want to do, but praise the Lord, you know. And fortunately for me, by the time they came, in, they came into a lottery system. And so basically what they would do, they'd have like a birthday line with a particular ball. And so we knew that if you were in the first 200 birthdays, then you're going to be a draft. But if you didn't, then mine came up, I think, 300 some something. I don't remember that. But, but again, they, they had this selective service in. And when you're called into the draft, you're called into the Army for two years. Or if you didn't want to go to the Army, you could enlist for four years in the other service. But the thing of it is you had certain terms you had to follow. But the minute you were drafted, you were no longer had your own mind, you know, your own ideas. You had to serve. You had to serve by the rules that the government set out. In Egypt, Israel was the same way that they had to serve according to God's terms. They didn't have a choice how they wanted to serve. They didn't have a choice when they wanted to. They had to serve by God's terms. And I guess it was it was well, some Israel really had an issue with they just could not they did everything great in lip service but for some reason they just could not come to turn with God's term of service even though there's great benefits I mean God said I was going to take care of you you're going to go to a land flowing with milk and honey I was going to deliver you from your area of bondage but for some reason they just couldn't deal with that in the same way with the later years um, during the Vietnam War there's a lot of protests against the draft a lot of burning draft cards a lot of people wanted to be conscientious objectors. A lot of people decided to flee to Canada to get away from the draft because they just didn't want to serve. The, I guess in their case, the lives are put on the line because they're going to be serving and they're going to the front lines. And I guess Israel was the same way. They were called to go to the front line. They were called to battle for the Lord. As part of the service, they had to battle for the Lord. They had to go out and get rid of all these people in God's promised land for them to take over. And a lot of them just did not want to do that. They weren't really easy. I mean, the first difficulty they ran the first thing god wanted them to cross the red sea that's all they had to do and their feet wasn't even going to get wet but when they saw the red sea they saw something that they couldn't get past so but they wanted to go back to egypt and the funny thing about that story is like they say didn't we tell you to leave us alone you should you should let us go back to egypt where we eat leeks and onions and sit down and just play shuffleboard with the egyptians and you know have s'mores and sing kumbawa around the fireplace they forget that they were in hard labor. They forget they had cried out to God, God, deliver me. You know, I mean, I don't know, guys, to me, you know, making bricks with straw, this is not exactly my something I want to go back to. Have you been set free from that? That's, but they forgot they were so concerned about the service that God called them into and not wanting to do that. Rather, they wanted to go back to Egypt. I mean, crazy. And, but God said, hey, you know, one minute, God is just, Hold it. God knows what he's doing. You got to follow orders. You know, same way troops are in battle. You got to follow orders. Even though you may not agree, you got to follow orders because the thing is you rely on the, the commander in chief to know what he's doing. And God, he knew exactly what he was doing. Part of the Red Sea went right through, right? And you thought you would think that would have been enough. And that didn't. So over and over, God had to deal with them. But, you know, God has said right from the beginning that, okay, I'm giving you off this benefits, but the consequences if you choose not to follow me. There's consequences if you choose not to want to serve me according to our terms. Uh, let's go to Deuteronomy. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30, please.
Deuteronomy chapter 30, and then we go to verse number 15. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is a reminder uh, to Israel about just what God expected of me, he says. Verse 15, see, I said before thee this day life and good, death and evil, and that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in the ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. The Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land where thou goest to possess it. I mean, I thought that's pretty good terms, right, if you ask me. Hey, he's going to look after us. He's going to take care of us. And I guess the same way when they had the draft, and even when you drafted, the government was going to clothe them. Maybe they're not top class, modern, trendy clothing, but they're going to keep them clothed. They can keep them fed, you know, three square meals. Sometimes they make guys eat whether they want to eat or not. And make sure you're healthy. I mean, you can't be sickly and serve, can you? Make sure you So all the basic needs were going to be met. And God did more than that. He says, look, guys, I'm going to look after you. I'm going to take care of you. He says, but there's a but in verse number 17. <clears throat> but if thou turn that, but if thine heart turn away, so that will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, for thou pass over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose left that both thou and thou see may live. And so, what Moses was trying to look, guys, this is it. I mean, the Lord said, if you choose to serve me, you accept that you're going to be blessed. But if you choose to want to be uh, disobedient, if you choose to want to be Oh, I can't think of, what's the word when somebody decides to want to go against military authority? Be insubordinate. There you go. I love that word. <laughs> but if you choose to be insubordinate, if you choose not to want to obey the commands, there's going to be dire consequences. I mean, in this guy, the dire consequence was death. I mean, even in the military today, if somebody's in service and they choose to be you know, uh, insubordinate, there's dire consequences from... Uh, you could be thrown in the brig if it was really serious. You could get court-martialed. And if it's really serious, you could get killed. You can die. I mean, they had right to kill people, to shoot them before firing squad if the, if the insubordination was that great. And see, that's just how dire things were with the Lord. Things were that dire. He says, guys, you got to understand that I've called you to a high calling. I called you to serve me. I called you to represent me before all the nations out there. And there's going to be great benefits if you choose to do that, but boy, the consequence is going to be dire. <clears throat> and like I said before, that you know, with the draft, was the same way that. You know, a lot of guys would go AWOL when they're caught there to face the consequences. A lot of guys decided just not want to obey officers. A lot of guys did not want to obey the orders. But, you know, unfortunately for the U.S. Armed Forces, they had to, they basically disbanded the draft. Because there was, at that time, there's so much outcry against it. So many people did not, I mean, just people going to jail, people just all, there's so many protests. The whole nation was up in the evil. So if anybody's ever, came to live through that late 60s, early 70s, you know, the, it was in such, it was a re really bad time. I mean, you know, the, nobody respected authority, they didn't want to go serve, so they had no choice but to abandon. So I think in the late 70s, basically said, okay, no more draft, we're going to go to an all voluntary army. And a lot of people had some concerns because they said, well, what are we going to get? We're going to just get the dregs, or we're just going to get whoever, and initially that's what happened at the Anybody who didn't want to get a job, they joined the army. And so army wound up with a lot of misfits. But what they did, they sort of got the act, they, they made it more attractive to enlist. I mean, they had a better program. They would the government take care of your education, take care of housing, uh, better pay. I mean, you, you got paid for being in the army. The pay wasn't that great, but you got paid. So the government did everything they could to make it look a little bit more attractive to to get people to enlist. And 
Uh, basically, God had to do the same thing. Okay, Israel had gotten so bad that he basically had nobody to represent him. He had no army left, really, because they'd taken the captivity. Everything he told them not to do, they did. And they had to pay the consequences of what happens. He had no army. He says, okay, well, what am I going to do? Hmm, let's see. I tried conscripting an army, a nation, and that didn't work. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to open it up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open the program. I'm going to make it a, a kind of a volunteer sort of service. I'll make it to where uh, people would enlist. So he had to do away with this. He introduced his new system of recruitment to God's godly service. And guess what? Jesus was the head of recruitment in a service called salvation. So now God says, okay, what I'm going to do now is uh, I need people to serve me, but I want them to make the choice to serve me. I'm going to put out all the benefits why they should serve me, and I'm going to do it to my son, Jesus. He was the head recruiter. He started all when you think about it. He went out and made the comment, guys, listen up. God still has, he still has got a plan. There's still some battles to be fought. There's still some war that we have to wage, but he needs people prepared to do it. You need people prepared to, to step up to the plate and serve, but it's going to be your choice. You know, I'm going to lay it all out before you. I'm going to lay everything out, and I'm going to leave it to your choice. I'm calling you just like Uncle Sam wants you. How many people have seen that poster? Uncle Sam wants you. God wants us. He, he's been making that call for 2,000 years. God wants man. He wants people to stand up and serve him. He wants people prepared to stand up and, and be obedient. There's great benefits. I mean, in this lifetime, I mean, guess what? The greatest benefit for serving God is we live forever. I don't think there's any army can offer anybody that. You know, you live forever. Praise the Lord. And that's and I guess that's what Jesus came to say. Is, is he wanted to get that message across that God has a whole new attitude about serving. Uh, go with me to John chapter 12, please. John chapter 12, just one quick verse right there. Verse number 26. It says, If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So Jesus said, If anybody serve me, then he's going to serve my father too. If if you're prepared to to follow and enter the terms of recruitment, the terms of enlistment, then there's going to be great benefits. So I guess people say, well, how, how, how do we enlist? It sounds all good. Where do I sign up? I mean, you, you see shows where they have these great recruitment drivers, the recruiters out there in their really nice uniforms, and they're, they're they're putting this glamorous life out there, and you know that you have your if you join the Marine, you too can be a sharpshooter. If you join the Air Force, you can be a top pilot. If you join the, the, the Navy, you're part of the Navy SEAL. So they paint this really good picture out there like, where do we sign up? What do we do? And so people heard the message that Jesus had to say. He saw some early recruiters like, what do we do? How do we sign up? Ta da And that question is asked nowadays. How do people sign up to be in God's service? How do people enlist to be part of God's service? But you should ask that. I'll tell you how you can do that. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. It's interesting because when you think about it, there are a lot of people out there, I guess, uh, like the same rebel rousing attitudes that they had, just like in the late 60s and 70s. They did not want to conform. They did not want anybody in authority to tell them what to do. They did not want anybody to upset the apple cart. And so they caused all sort of ruckus. Same thing with Jesus. Here he was recruiting the greatest service anybody could ever do in their entire life. So they killed the recruiter. So they figured, well, we killed the recruiter in the story. Duh, didn't work. He'd already lined up his recruits already. 120 
people on the day of Pentecost, they were the first recruits. They were the beginning of God's selection. So they were the beginning of God's plan of salvation. I mean, you, you think about it, 120 people is what we're the result of today. 120 people decide, we want to serve. We, we, we're going to go by what Jesus said. He said, wait here. We'll be sworn in. We'll get all our credentials, and we'll go and be able to take the fight out. And that's exactly what they did. And so when some people said, no, what do we sign up? What do we do? If you're in Acts chapter 2, please, in verse number 37. It says, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said, and to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every morning in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There it is right there. That, that's what you got That's what you got to do to side up. There's no other way, folks. Anybody wants to be in God's service, anybody wants to be called as part of his great army, anybody wants to enjoy the benefits, that is the only sign-up procedure you have. Same with any service. Any service, you got to go to a recruitment office. you got to sign some papers, and you got to be sworn in. You just can't go and just buy a uniform from the Army and Navy stores. Yep, I'm in the Army, now I'm going to just go out and fight. You would be an imposter. Because there are heavy penalties for impersonating somebody in the army. And guess what? There's heavy penalties for somebody impersonating being part of God's army. Unless people out there trying to do it each and every day, they, they want the recognition. But then he points out, oh, no, I'm done with this. They wouldn't be able to do that. That's not the way it is. It's, there's only one way somebody can be part of God's army. There's only one way we can answer the calling through the process of salvation. That's what we have to do. And again, you know, just like I said earlier, that even though there's great benefits, we still have terms of service. In the Lord, we still have terms of service. We still have terms, conditions that we have to follow. Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians chapter 4, we we'll pick it up with verse number 1. And this is the Apostle Paul talking. <clears throat> Excuse me. I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, even as you're called, one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. And we know this is just a few points that as part of our terms of service. We, all throughout the New Testament, the letters that Apostle Paul, he basically said, look, guys, I got to remind you the terms of the service. I have to remind you what you've been recruited to do. You continue to keep this in mind. And then you can take care of the benefits, I guess, every day, you know, when you're, when you're, so you're out there drilling in one day. One of the things they want to instill into you is the ability to follow orders. Because a lot of people who sign up for the Army, they have no clue about following orders. They want to do their own thing. So one of the first things, particularly the Army, they want to break your will, so to speak. They want you to conform. They want, that's why they sit out there drilling people every day. That's why they get out there marching every day. Not that they're going to have to be marching about it, but to teach them to follow orders and to conform to terms. And so we're in the same way with us. We're in the Lord, and we have to follow that. We're in the Lord. We're, we've been recruited. And so every day we have to re be reminded of what we have to do. Let's finish, finish on Romans chapter 12, please. Which, as you all know by now, are two of my most favorite verses. Verses Romans chapter twelve, verse one, and it says, <clears throat> "I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service." 
that's basically what we've been called to do. That's that's in a nutshell, isn't it? To present our bodies as a living sacrifice and let God take care of everything after that. And why do we want to do this? And he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's that's what God wants us to do. That's all part of his service. And we call and it's something we shouldn't take lightly, but we just should also be thankful for it and all the people say it. All right, we're gonna have a time.